All right, you guys can see this okay, right? Yeah, it looks great. Okay, uh, so I guess a couple of things. First of all, um, does everybody agree? I, I think there's no disagreement on the fact that the real main hall transponder we would use is probably going to be both uh, digital and both uplink and downlink. Correct. Do, do, do I have to make a case for that or is that under no, no, kind of no. like? No, not to me and not to anybody that's actually plugging away on on making certain yeah, no, th code. There would have been a time where this would have been heretical within the amateur community, that's for sure. Oh, but I fought through that in 2017, 2018. It's yeah, I yeah, but no, I'm, I'm okay, solidly so I, the, the all digital up, digital down, it regenerates it, multiplexes it. That's what it does. Yeah. Okay, so if if you buy into the fact that we pretty much have to talk about higher orbits for operational systems, yeah, Leos can, can work, but even Leos might want to be digital. But for an operational system, um, the way to get the capacity up is is to take advantage of, of the gain that you can derive. And um, of course, at the same time, that we're going up in altitude on an operational sense we're also going down in spacecraft size because of cost you know we we aren't the first guys on the block to ever launch uh, a, a little spacecraft anymore <laughs> there was once when i could stand on the top of the gantry and say my god this is just amazing we're launching our own spacecraft and it's little and it really works <laughs> but I can't say that that's a unique thought anymore. But in 1974, when AO 7 was launched, and I was really proud, those days are pretty far gone. <laughs> so anyway, um, and as we go up, of course, the, the way to, be, to win the game is if you have gain on the uplink and the downlink, the higher the frequency, the more capacity you can have. Uh, um, because you're canceling one one over r squared loss factor that you would otherwise have, and the other aspect is that if you're using digital and you use forward error correction by going to the double coder decoder world, like you get with DVB-S2 or S2X, then you're getting the required EBNO signal to noise ratio. C over N zero, whatever you want to call that parameter, which is signal to noise ratio, you require way less signal to noise ratio by about as much as 16 to 18 dB than you require if you don't use any coding at all. So the, the, the win is going up in frequency and up in FEC coding level. So is that, is that concept okay? Well, that's what they gave me a master's degree about, so I'm with you so far. All right, very good. Uh, uh, all right, so now to the spreadsheet. This this is an evolution of a lot of different things uh, plugged together and a whole bunch of new stuff added in. But I I was I've never actually used it in a corporate environment where people actually use this thing in a configuration and control environment. But I set it up to be able to do that. So that if you have various engineers and, and over overviewers, project managers, or whatever, if they tick the if they tick the box, then their box turns green. And when finally the, there's some configuration control dude who says, "Okay, we'll do it," then the whole thing turns green. Now the idea is to um, pass code protect these these green squares. So that so that you can only enter it in if you are the comm engineer, if you are the PM, and so forth. And so once all the boxes are green, that means the document's ready to release. So that's just a a toy I put in there, and I put all kind of notes to try and make it easier to do document configuration control here. Cool. So that was what the first page is about, and then the second page follows up every time you do a revision. This is what the revision tree looks like for this this document that has been revived. And you see it goes all the way back to August of 2010. And some elements of this actually go back to about 2001. 
So this is a uh, long in evolution. Um, and what I try and do is use colors in a specific way. And I do this on every single spreadsheet I do on any subject is I make the blue, uh, the blue cells, the entry data, the, the yellow cells, the results. And if they're black or blue, blue means I can probably change it without stepping on the formula. Black, if I, enter, if I modify a cell, it's just a white cell with black text. I killed the formula and I, I might as well start over because <laughs> the, the, the spreadsheet probably won't work after that or I won't be able to change some parameter at all once I've screwed that up. So uh, it's always a good idea with my spreadsheet since I, I haven't password protected everything in them to uh, save a clean copy of it. Uh, uh, so you always have a fresh copy in case you step on cells which I do to myself all the time, so that, that's it. Oh, I see something I forgot to do. Up here at the top, it says enable content. This has to do with that, that the way it, uh, this pro software uses the RAIN model. Remember the RAIN model um, uses... Um, yes. Yeah, what is it? Um, <laughs> uh, you mean the standard? The no, no, database, no it, it, the database. Yeah, yeah, it uses a database, but it also modifies. Uh, oh gosh, darn it! I always do this to myself. Um, an ITC model. It's an ITU model. Yeah. But um, oh, uh, it, it 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 uses macros, so this enables the macros to be to be used. So I'll if I enable that. Uh, let me see if I can show you here anything. Uh, let's see. In look at the downlink here. No, it's it's still a valid copy, so it's not it's not going to prove that I'm doing it. Yeah, we but, ran into this yeah. before because it looked like a valid copy on my Macintosh, and you said that's yeah. In the first, in, in, in right up until you change one of the critical cells, it will yeah, work. Yeah, yeah, because you had me. So change, as delivered copy works. And then after you make one modification, it won't work anymore. Right. So That's exactly what happened. Yeah. So if you've done this properly, you should get this this uh, this this inquiry here where it asks you have you have you just enabled or disabled the the macros, and so you enable the content. And uh, and and so then now now we have made it so that the IT rain model will work in this. Excel spreadsheet, and we and we got to still solve that problem for everybody. It it, it turns out for um, that the fix I gave you works for older versions of Windows uh, Windows ten, but not uh, not after about Windows ten point four. I think you and I discussed this, but there was yeah. an epic beyond which if you've got a newer piece of software, then it will not recognize thirty two bit words explicitly. You have to tell it some piece of information we haven't figured out yet. So it knows this is a 32-bit uh, piece of software, not a 64-bit piece of software. Exciting. And that, that's where we're hung up right now on that. This machine is an old machine. It uses an old version of Windows 10. And so when I put that DLL file into my system 32 folder, it, it does it and it works properly. Okay, so um, the, the way you drive this thing is I've put in what's called a scenario planner, which allows you to make quick changes to things you, you, you want to find out. And these are all the things in the blue area here. I've got two methods of changing the antenna size. One is changed on another sheet I'll show you, or I can alternatively, um, use a, another antenna here. So I have two ways of defining antennas. Specifically on the uh, user terminal setup, I do it uh, and uh, it's done there. And the other way is to do it here. And, and the, the upper one assumes that the antenna size for the uplink and the downlink antenna could be different, which could easily happen in the amateur service. Whereas uh, if, if you have the common 
antenna for up and down. It assumes you might have a diplex or something in two different feeds on the dish. So it depends on which one you'd use there. Uh, I select the receiver bandwidth, but the way it, I've got it set right now, it's kind of from uh, some old commercial stuff. It gives you an option of what ones you can pick. And if you don't like that, you have to go over to the, this section over here on the right and load in different options. And that, that's kind of clunky right now. So that's one thing I don't like. And then, so I've got it set now with, so I have the receiver bandwidth is very narrow and the transmit bandwidth is as wide as it can be. Now, that means we're kind of operating the downlink as a combined combination of all the uplinks. So think of the downlink as a TDMA and the uplink as an FDMA, but it could be an FDMA, CDMA type of, of link. But right now, I've got, and I would say this is just until this was socialized so we could figure out what we really wanted to do. But this assumes 10 kilohertz channels. And at these microwave frequencies, that's, that's pretty narrow to try and keep track of. Uh, and Phil Karn had lots of ideas about how we could get around that. He, he didn't mind the narrow channels and he felt the receiver could be smart enough to keep track of a whole bunch of channels at the same time even including Doppler and even including the fact that the user may have a pretty lousy uplink uh, stability oscillator and it could be able to do that. So um, that needs some more discussion than we have time for today. But uh, I've assumed here that we have a, a very narrow band uplinking user and there are multiple users. So this is an FDMA uh, multi-access thing Whereas on the downlink, we're assuming every user is receiving the same carrier with the same modulation and the same coding and the same mod cod step. Um, and so they, uh, the channel sorting out is done in, in TDMA in that mode. So that's, that's the assumption made here. There's only, we're only looking at one channel on the uplink and one channel on the downlink. Right. And and for the rain, we've turned off the, the rain, which really turns off the cloud attenuation and the rain attenuation in the ITU link model, not the rest of the losses like the atmospheric losses, which are very critical as well. So I have what you call the clear, clear sky condition and the rain on condition. So we have the rain. It's asking, is the rain turned on? The answer is no. So that's the clear sky. But if the rain is turned on, the statistics it applies are 99.5%, which means the rain is such that 99.5% of the time that this link will work and 0.5% of the time it will not, statistically speaking. That, so that amount of rain is what's computed by the rain model. Okay. And then the last point here is that that um, this uh, if I have a green parameter, it means it's transferred from another page. And we're going to talk about your stations in a minute. But you'll you'll know that for anything with involves a lot of rain, like like uh, 24 gigahertz does, um, that you will uh, it will very much the link will very much depend on where you're located. So I made it easy to be able to swap link lo uh, uh, user locations so you could just plunk the user in. It will, it will flow into this sheet and then in, into the, the RAIN model, and it will instantaneously change the link for that location, latitude, longitude, and altitude. So that's how this parameter is used. It's passed on. It's just to let you know at a glance, this link is for this location. Right. Right. OK. Now, and then what it does is it, it tells you the results here. So I, I put in those gross parameters. There's obviously lots of other parameters you want to know. But if you want to play with these parameters, you can do that and see immediately what's changed. So the first is the for an adaptive mod, mod cut. And I've assumed here we'll not be able. And, and there's a long discussion we could have about the the DVBS2 mode. There's uh, there's VCM, ACM, and CCM. CCM means I'm never going to change the, the, the mod cod step. VCM means I'm controlling it by command. So the, the, the command operator actually has to enter in to the decision on what mod cod step to use. 
And ACM is adaptive coding and modulation where the link is conditioned by what the user's uplink is. The downlink will be correspondingly adjusted or vice versa. Yeah, we are, so, uh, so our baseline is ACM and that is, we've also worked in uh, adaptive coding and modulation has worked into the authentication and authorization and the startup and the acquisition. Uh, so our baseline okay. is uh, so ACM. It, it would make it therefore more difficult to determine based on power available how many how many channels were available and how you know what the the channel loading status is yes but just for the for, for the sake of this discussion i'm using vcm here which means the the telecommand operator is keeping track of what the status of the loading of the transponder is and it changes the mod cut step when on average for all the users over the whole earth that are looking at this transponder and using this transponder what the average performance for those users are because some users right. are at low elevation angles some are at high elevation angles and the difference in the performance given the, the how dynamic um dvbs 2 x is you can have a very big range of settings you could use here uh, and they would work for some users very well, but they work very poorly for other users. So right. not sure that that's a whole discussion area, but what this is, is the, the results of the uplink. So uh, what this is doing is summarizing the whole situation for the user uplink. It's the bandwidth, what mod cod step was satisfied, what the data rate was. So in a 10 kilohertz channel here, I got 16.9 kilobits per second. I have a uh, spectral efficiency of 1.8 bits per hertz or bits per symbol. Uh, it's giving you some feeling for what the 99.5 link uh, rain situation would be. It's, hold, it's hold, giving hold on you- for a minute. Hold, on, hold on for a second. Sure. Our uplinks are totally independent from our downlinks. Exactly here and um yeah they are they are here too our uplinks will not be dvb2 s2 there'll be sure. a more conventional modulation okay well i i've they'll assumed be, here they'll that be they're... Coded. they'll be coded yeah you know, there'll be something you could use as an approximation one of the ccp you know models uh one over four to three over four right Okay, well, but okay, so uh, I'm not, uh, and and does can you can the user change that FEC coding to you, from from any different steps depending on his conditions? No, it's all automatic. He he'll 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 basically his his. Well, I don't, I don't mean the operator necessarily, but but does the transmitter itself adjust? to the link so there are different forward error correction values yes, yes. the receive the receivers as part of as part of a start of transmission will determine what frequency is actually being used will will lock to that frequency and will adjust the input filters to get the maximum um performance Okay, so, no, so it's, 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 but you're not using, you're, you're not using the coding schemes as specified in DVB-S2. No, not at all. Yeah, you can so see can, here, uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, that's okay. Um, I, I can send you um, the protocol for the, for the uplink, because uh, we, we now have, have one. Um, and I'll make sure that, that you get a copy. It's uh, pretty cool. Yeah, well, okay. Uh, what it would do is it would change the table I'm going to show you here uh, that that selects this. But but as long as there are multiple steps, then what would be displayed here once adjusted would be the what was achieved in the link result. So it says, okay, this is what I was able to achieve for the price of this parameter right here. Uh, this data uplink carrier to noise power density ratio. Think of this number, if you will, and it's used in almost everybody's digital communication uh, link yep. parameter set. 
Uh, it's the equivalent of the one hertz bandwidth signal to noise ratio. So if I put a carrier of this strength into a, through a one hertz filter, that's the signal to noise ratio I get out of that filter. So it's an easy way of, uh, and it's, it's, it's a nice number that goes from, you know, the low 20s to above 100, and it gives you an indication of link performance. It's nice in the way of you mentally thinking about it, but in addition to that, you always know that's the signal noise ratio I get if I was putting that whole signal into a single carrier and I was looking at it with a one hertz filter on the ground. And then it tells me, oh, by the way, you've got clear sky uh, uh, conditions, atmosphere and scintillation only are the only two excess path loss factors considered. This is the effect achieved signal to noise ratio. And if you want to talk about energy per symbol to noise power density ratio, which is another thing used as a common parameter within the DVBS2 world, that's, that's that computed version of the signal to noise ratio. Then you have the same thing for the downlink, but, but here you see the bandwidth uh, is, uh, is now up to a megahertz. And in a megahertz, I can actually get through that thing at a, I think I'm using a Nyquist roll off, which is how deep the skirts on the filter are. I, I think I'm using 10%. I might be using five. I think I'm using 10%. So uh, yeah, that yeah, would be 10%. So 10%, I can get- It doesn't go that low. It should be, I believe the lowest is 20. We'll most likely megahertz. use 35. Well, but we may understand that we may all we may we may not have a we'll we'll have fil a filter. However, there will be um, growth, spectral growth from clipping that might occur in the output stage. Spectrum regrowth, yeah, <clears throat> I've got I've got ways of adjusting for that. By the way, in the model here, but that's down in the guts. But this is this is the net effect of what you remember. What we said: the uplink is separated from the downlink. So the the, the uplink, the guy who when he's either talking or sending digital text or video or whatever he's sending, it's going to be digitized and put into a you know a, a, a payload computer. And then that payload computer is going to insert the results of that, that old guy's uplink data stream. He's going to merge it with the other uplink data streams into a TDM downlink stream. That's the assumption I'm making here. Yeah, well, the, multiplexer, the multiplexer is essentially, it, it's, it is doing some processing of the data to eliminate some uh, things that are necessary and handle call signs. And sure, like sure. You, you yeah, can and, and, and it might even, I, I could imagine it would even realize maybe you need a parameter that says, this is a voice conversation, this is special data, this is video, you know, yeah. it might have modes in it or something like that. Yeah. I, I realize there's going to be all kinds of cool uh, GUIs and things going on for people to know what, what's, what they're getting from the other guy. That, that, that's understood. But this is just if we're looking at gross bits here in the data stream, and what it's saying is, okay, for that, for this case, <clears throat> and we'll we'll show you where we are. I think we're at Apogee in this right at this minute. <clears throat> I can support with DVBS2. It will support Q, QPSK rate one half, which is about the third mod cut step in the DVBS2 X stack. Um, and I'm getting for that 910 mega symbols, I'm getting about 0.9 megabits per second out of the link. And the, the C over N0 that gave me that was 60.62. And my spectral efficiency, which is kind of something I like to keep track of, is, uh, is um, you know, about 0.98. So right about a bit per, per symbol. And, uh, you know, th then the rest, and you can see the, the C over N and the signal to noise ratio for this link is only a half dB. Now, there were days when NASA couldn't decode a link like that. 
I mean, that's that's a that's a pretty shabby signal to noise ratio. And the fact that we can <clears throat> get, you know, almost a megabit per second out of that kind of signal to noise ratio shows the power of DVB. Uh, it's really cool. Okay, now I put this new thing in here because it's a it's a discussion area. Um, if you assume that every bit that goes up, give or take some control bits, is going to have to come back down, then um, the downlink capacity. Uh, my metric here has been that with a six-use spacecraft, I wanted to be able to tell the commission that we could. Uh, support a minimum of 100 voice grade communications conversations, which means 200 users minimum could be supported with this asset. So if I use 6.25 kilobits per second as the threshold for the data rate that must be closed by the average user, then I can have an average channel count on the downlink based on the fact that I could get 899 kilobits per second. If I had to divide that into 6.25 kilobit chunks, I could support 143 channels. However, the link on the uplink supports 16.95 kilobits for this particular user. So is, is that confusing in any way no but in in the way Michelle, that... i don't think it's confusing i think our kind of our baseline but, assumption is to have a much wider channels per user yeah um, well anyway back to, right. so, back to Wall. So what what we're, what we're going to talk about now is what happens when various things happen uh but what i i can tell you is i'm wringing the wash rag about as hard as i can for the power I've got available uh, at the frequencies involved and for, for the locations on the earth where I have, uh, I, I've, I've, got, uh, I've got quite a, uh, this, is, this is about as far as I can go. So what, what did, okay, so let's just continue. But I put this summary down here and the main thing is to see, regardless of where I am in the orbit and the kind of users I use, I'm always checking back this parameter here. Oh, okay. And this is just a figure of merit for me. It says, I yes. want that number to be very close to 100. And if I do that, then I, as an operator of a satellite system of this kind, of meeting my commitments to the community to provide this 100 channels for two-way to N-way communications. Yeah, I strongly concur with having, having that always be something that we can either generate or, or derive. Yeah, and, and how you do that um, is going to be, be involve some very fun, cool software. I think uh, in, in in the system, or you may have a different way you configure the whole thing in mind that I I haven't come up with yet, which is entirely possible. But this is the way I wanted you to understand the way my brain was working on this. So if you're trying to optimize this, what you're trying to do really, I think, is first try and get the downlink down here in the bottom. We can go back, we can go to the downlink here. Uh, this, this number here, we want to try and optimize that number because that's going to, I found it sets my, my capacity a lot more than if I try and optimize the uplink number. Right. Uh, because that this 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 caps this causes the channel count to cap more than the uplink does, right? Which is an interesting finding. I mean, you you have to actually run enough of, the, of these to yeah, to come I mean, to that conclusion. But that is the conclusion right. I've come. To. That's it's yeah. not. Uh, this is this is really exciting to to see and uh, really useful. Because uh, I don't know if we have talked about that or or have had a, a an appreciation uh, for that type of of uplink downlink interaction yet. At least uh, I'm speaking for myself, I haven't. Wally yeah. probably has since he's done uh, this class of work in the in the past and is. Uh, but yeah, having this in the spreadsheet and being able to to check it when you're uh, walking through is uh, really valuable. Yeah. 
so we could we could talk now you can think about this as a data rate but imagine this is this is after all the coding has been stripped off this is the true bits i think what you call raw bits delivered to the user now that in this particular example the user is actually able to achieve 16.95 but why did i not use a higher number here the reason is because if these are the raw bits and these actually get uh presented to the computer which is going to do uh, let's say just pack packs those 6.25 kilobits of data into the downlink frame and the downlink frame is sent and the user the ultimate user on the end is going to receive those 6.25 kilobits from the other side of the link from from the guy he's talking to all right now he's going to put that into if it's an, if it's a talking to since he's not using single sideband he's going to be using a vocoder right he's going to be using a voice decoder here now the real question is what do you need in the amateur radio community to make the average ham happy about the the data he's listening to as a voice now if i go to commercial standards you both probably you're familiar with good old Iridium, yes. who decided that the, the vocoder they would use in their, their, their satellite phones was going to be 2.4 kilobits per second. Right. And then you'll probably know that Global Star, which was designed by Qualcomm, the data standard was designed by Qualcomm. Qualcomm uses a voice decoder after the removal of some overhead bits. Of, they go into the vocoder at 8 kilobits per second. Right. Now, the 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 um the already one sounds like crap and the and and the global star one sounds like stereo you know st stereo coming over your car radio all right so i would say that the global star was too good and the iridium was too bad so eight kilobits is too high and 2.4 kilobits is too low so I figured an amateur might be okay with six to five to seven kilobits per second. Now that's, that's how I came up with picking that channel. Yeah, I think way too high. Wally is normal. yeah, Wally's pretty happy, I think, with with the numbers that you're talking about. To to me, I'm very much uh one of the absolute requirements is is this we cannot have crappy voice. We cannot have crappy codecs. The the quality has to be really, really good. And that's but just- understand, Michelle, there's two cases. There's one, what we actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. And number two is how we demonstrate our good shepherd, uh, shepherd uh, that we're good shepherds of spectrum. Yeah, I don't think it's wasted to make it sound gorgeous. It's that's not a uh, that's not squandering spectrum or anything like that. You know, we don't have the same uh, you know motivations yeah. as the commercial people do for squeezing uh, lots and lots of subscribers out of every well, every, every hertz. I, I I think the fact that we're having this discussion would tickle a member of the Federal Communication Commission to think that we actually are thinking about this trade factor that we don't want to present crap to our users that's right and we don't, and we want to be good shepherds of our spectrum so we're struggling with this number so what i would tell you guys is this we number to one. me along with the channel count they set the way the real transponder system works yes if do. if there is only one kind of channel now you but guys could tell me, well, I could break this transponder up into multiple uh, transponders, each with its own data stream set. So that maybe rather than having three TDM, uh, one TDMA link, I have two or three TDM links. One is for voice, one is for, for data, and the other is for some kind of video link. Correct. A slow that's, scan. You can. Yes, yeah, that's totally a good summary of this. They're, they're independent, and it's. We are not going to build in a codec. That is, that's a application layer. No, I, I assume you wouldn't build in a codec, but this still is what that six point two five two is telling me is 
that's the average data rate that right. I want to achieve for the average user, regardless of validation angle and location, and that that number will ultimately, along with the downlink performance, that 898, 8.96 kilobits per second, that will tell me how many channels I, I have available given the the, the the ERP I have from the transponder. Right. Totally right. on board. So that so when I give you guys when I give you guys this adjusted spreadsheet, taking into account whatever changes we make because of say that you're not using DVB on the uplink, that then that then you guys can. Uh, along with the user community and people who are helping, you can socialize this and figure out what that number, what everybody wants that number to be. But it's 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 one of the key parameters. This box contains the key parameters for the system. Yeah, if somebody wants to sound like ASUS System Fusion, or if they want to sound like Iridium, they can choose the application that provides that. If they want to sound uh, gorgeous, yeah, you know, and you're going to be able to to recognize the person, hear an emotion in their well, voice, that sort of thing. But then that is a different application be, at the user level. But be be aware if they if they end up choosing a larger number for the for that that blue box, then they are using more spacecraft resources, which That's make right. less space. So this is this becomes a socialism. <laughs> yes, uh, you're right. It does. Debate. Well. In, in practical terms, our channels are are eight hundred n times eight hundred, and they range from eight hundred to twelve hundred. Uh, channels in in the transponder. Yes, as we pass them over from the multiplexer to as they're passed over. Any channel can be allocated n eight hundred bits per second. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you're, you're, you, what you're doing is you're, you're you're channelizing the bits, whereas what I'm doing is letting the bits change, and I'm trying to uh, express that as a channel count. So I'm using as a variable the channel count. You're keeping the channel count constant. And adjusting other parameters to, to make that work. So that that's yeah, I think both are now. both are valuable, and we need to to make sure that yeah. we understand uh, both our 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 assumptions, and then this really uh, useful way of looking at it. You know, because it's this yeah. speaks both of these. This speaks directly to uh, a whole lot of architecture. Well, that, that you know, this is a complicated thing we're doing here. So that's right. Uh, uh, I'm just showing you my slice at it in the way in in the way it evolved in uh, it evolves in in the case of this in the expression of this link budget because of all the prior experiences I've had with both amateur and commercial communications and everything else. It's a synthesis of everything that's happened in my career, so it's not so surprising that you know I have a particular flavor here. But there, but because it's such a sophisticated standard, we can do this many, many other ways. So they, they, that's yeah. what I'm trying to do is get yeah. to yes here if we can figure out how to do it. Right. Yeah, we've got, uh, right. so there's many, many uh, directions and, and ways to do it. It's it's very exciting. Yes, yeah. in, in practical terms, what a station, how, how, how many bits a station can uplink? will base, be based on that station's performance, mostly antenna right. size and power. Right, right, well, and, and that's, okay, for that, okay. All right, all right, let, let, let me think about that for a minute. And, and so we aren't here till midnight tonight, my time, we probably should kind of move on here. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, I, what I've got here is now we're going to talk a little bit about the orbit and how the orbit figures into this whole thing along with with antennas and stuff. So this comes from many, many of my old spreadsheets. This is just a, a, a mini orbit summarizer here, which actually works if you're just thinking about orbits. It actually dynamically computes some things and maybe you don't need them all here. But the key point is you want to set the uh, 
in my blue boxes, you want to set the, the apogee height, and that's the height of a geo orbit, 35786. And then the height of the perigee, let's talk about that for a second. We go back to the, er, the iridium and uh, one, web, one web and friends. And that is that these guys are going to say they own these altitudes. And the highest altitude I know that's been assigned is, I think, 1050 ish. Yeah. 1050 to, to 1100. I think the highest one I really know of for sure is 1100. Yeah, previously, uh, the, the, when we, we've we talked about this before, we I think we decided to give that number a little margin. Yep, yep. And that's why I came up with the 12, we came up with the 1250. Yeah, but, yeah I think it's a good, it's and, a good and number. And you'll see that, you'll see that reflected in that Delta V calculation document, which I also gave you. So anyway, um, if we do 1250, it means we fly over the heads of all those other constellations which are down here buzzing around the Earth. So we're a little bit above those. So even our perigee doesn't cross through the orbits of all this god-awful NGSO FSS mayhem nightmare that's going on that, that SpaceX is creating. Okay? And we go up to, we just kiss the geo altitude, I mean, you know, you might make that a few kilometers less or something. So we technically never get into the geo world either. Depends on how you want to play this game. Um, I can tell you that when you're launched into these orbits, there tends to be an apogee bias on them. So that rather than going to 35,786, they'll really put you at about 36,300. And it, since we'll be riding with some geo operator who's going to own that rocket, they're going to set the apogee, but realize they're probably going to set the apogee a little bit above the geo altitude. That helps them for some reason in their propellant management. I never exactly understood why the geos do that, but they do it all the time. So you might be in a starting orbit that's 36,300 or so by, by uh, 250. So what we have to do is take it up from 220 to 250 up to this 1250 and that burn cost is about 100 meters per second all right so now what we do is we care about how we perform as we're at these various points along the orbit so i just made a list here and i called perigee one and apogee uh, 13 and i put down here 14 for somebody who wants to put some in between values that's that's a user defined parameter there. So at 14, I can go put in these parameters. I think actually, let me see if I change that. It, would, it does change 166. Yeah, it does. So the, uh, I just have to change whatever the mean anomaly I want to look at is, and it will calculate the other stuff for me. And uh, don't worry about this, but there's some subtleties about the amount of the earth you see and what the noise temperature will be. Huh, I see if I've lost that value. That's supposed to be the uh, noise temperature uh, of the... Uh, I don't know, that got erased. That's me stepping on myself. Okay, uh, so anyway, what 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 happens here is I can pick any any spot I want around the orbit. Now there's some parameters involved. Uh, this alpha value is uh, what am I going to do with the bore side of the the main antenna that I'm pointing this spacecraft with? In other words, I'm going to point if this is a dual frequency antenna. I think you said uh, then the bore side of that antenna could be offset from uh, the line of uh, the, the, the instantaneous line between the center of the earth and the center of the spacecraft. I could off point from that, but I've made the assumption here that that, that value is zero. And you'll see it here expressed in this cell, which is uh, K31. That cell allows me to offset the angle 
of that antenna. But what I'm assuming by putting that at zero is that alpha is always zero, regardless of which case I pick between case one and case 13. So another way of saying it is I'm always nadir look, uh, yeah, I'm always nadir looking with that antenna. So is that okay? Well, what kind of station keeping is required to do that? Normal station keeping that you would require for any Leo or any, any system that has uh, an antenna with the gains of the kind we have here. And we'll, we'll, we can talk about that. But um, uh, we assume that this is going to be a three axis attitude controlled spacecraft. Okay. Uh, now, all six U's and bigger spacecraft that are launched right now for the rest of the community, all is pretty well standardized on using one of a couple kinds of wheels and star tracker. They, they use a star tracker. So we can point these six U spacecraft to uh, about 0 0.01 degrees uh, sustainably. Okay, okay. Now, and there, is, there is a problem. You have with, to the wheels? Yeah, yeah that's, that, 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 uh, that's the rest of my sentence. There, there, there is a problem with dumping the momentum from the wheels. And we had it in the old phase three program as well. We were, we were controlling, we didn't have star trackers. We had sun and earth sensors, but we had the same requirement that we had to dump momentum from the wheels uh, or from the spacecraft at least because it was a spinner spacecraft. So our wheel was the spacecraft itself. But be that as it may, we did have to remove a, a momentum and dump it. And the only place we can do that is at the perigee of the orbit. That's another reason for setting that perigee as low as we dare. It's, it also will reduce our delta V to razor and lower the system, but it also sets the amount of time we can effectively torque to remove the, uh, to dump the momentum, angular momentum. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, the rest of this in the yellow table here is describing uh, where we are with respect to the antenna roll off and everything. And, and let, let's, let's go to another, this is a summary chart to allow you to, to see how well you're doing and to set the two important, what you're doing on this page is setting two parameters. One is which step case am I gonna use? In effect, how high up is the spacecraft that's gonna, be important to the link budget so it knows the range it's got to communicate over. And it's telling you, if I'm at step 13, I'm at 35, 786 altitude. If I'm at step, let's pick another one, nine, then the range goes down to 13, 399 kilometers. So that adjusts that one. The other thing is think about the users in this model by virtue of their elevation angle as the most important parameter. If I put in 10 degrees here as I have, it means the locus of points all around the earth in a ring of all those users would, that would be at 10 degrees elevation angle, give or take. Okay, so when I put in an elevation angle, think of not one user, but all the users that have that elevation angle and this link would work for all of them. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. And for 10 degrees elevation angle at that altitude, the slant range to that user at 10 degrees, all those users at 10 degrees would be 45, 586. Okay. Now, do you have Doppler in here? No, I do not put Doppler in here. Um, I could put Doppler easy enough in this great gray table here. If we put it, we'd have to we'd have to decide whether we want to do well. We could put it both in uplink Doppler and downlink Doppler could be put in this table, and that would be the appropriate place to do that. Okay. Yeah, that that that's a good suggestion. Uh, so we know what what that would be. 
good, good point indeed. Um, I tried on these yellow parameters to define a little more what, what I was really talking about here. But as you can see, by, by driving this, if I change these links over here, I can immediately tell what I've done to my C over N plus I zero. That, that's the end ultimate link result on the uplink and the downlink. I think I got that right. Yeah, yeah. The, that's the uplink. That's the downlink. Okay. And now what I'm trying to do is keep track of where in the heck. In addition to Doppler, and it may be too complicated for the model, uh, it would be useful to have the, um, the drift rate. Oh, the, the drift rates are there. The, the, oh. the, the omega dt is how much the uh, argument uh, of parity changes. And right. d cap d, d omega dt is how much the right ascension changes, the orbit plane changes per, in yes. degrees per day. Say again? OK, so those are, those are in. OK. And, and it's telling you also what the period, the nominal period of the orbit. Ah, uh, here we go. Uh, uh, I can't, I can't draw my own, there, OK, now I got it. All right, so over here on the right, what we have is a pictogram of, of what's going on. You see that parameter up there at the top, alpha again. So that's how much I'm off, off pointing this thing. but it's telling you now where with respect to the user is this is this beam I'm going going to going to place the um, so you can see that the zero elevation angle which is the is the row parameter here is is defined so you can see how much of the earth is illuminated by uh, uh, in, in degrees by, by that angle, you can tell what angle the user is at relative to, to the, uh, the beam center. So the beam is gonna be centered on this line. And then I don't recall anymore what my, my uh, blue cone is. But, Anyway, again, I can see what uplink and downlink I've achieved is, and these are all. This is just the uh, a, an observation table. You don't change anything in this table because you'll see there's nothing that's blue. But you, the main thing is you can see for this user uh, at 10 degrees elevation angle how much downlink beam roll off has occurred and how much uplink beam roll off has occurred. Now, do you have any allowance for the? Um... Pointing error at the or at the. I I have a pointing error in the real link budget. Yes. Okay. It's not. It, it isn't quite so easily reflected here, and, and you'll see that. Okay. So we've done done with the uh, with sort of this is where you can visualize what's happening with the orbit, and particularly what's happening with respect to the beams, and the and the real thing to notice. It, that's that's going to interact here is as I come away from apogee and start moving more toward perigee, my beam width is not likely going to change unless you guys have, are building an adaptive beam width antenna. That would be great. But um, the effect of having a fixed beam width as you get closer to the earth is you're beginning to under under illuminate the earth. Therefore, users at lower elevation angles are gonna be seeing more and more roll off from, from the beam that you're creating toward them, either on the uplink or the downlink. And you, and you can see here from this one, in this case, this, the spacecraft's at apogee, the user is at 10 degrees. So he's off pretty far off the, 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 uh, the, the, the line of apsides, the, the semi-major axis, of the, the major axis of the orbit. He's pretty far away from that. So he's going to see the worst case, case effects of the beam roll off. He's going to be at the largest angle away from the, uh, the, the bore site. And you can see for the downlink antenna, for its gain, he's, he's rolled off 1 dB. And for the uplink, he's rolled off 3 dB. OK? All right, we'll come back to this. But the next thing is I realized that because this is a rain, rain model, that the 
location of the user is going to make a big, huge difference. So what I wanted to do was be able to plug into the case you're studying very quickly, a place where you can change the, the, the user. So right now we've got number nine in there. So that's Boulder, Colorado. And that's an intentional choice because I consider it sort of the average rain loss location in the whole US. It's not a wet place and it's not a dry place. And it's a place where there are lots and lots and lots of meteorological measurements made because NOAA's there, uh, uh, NCAR is there. Everybody who knows anything about weather is in Boulder. So you can find out the weather conditions in Boulder better than any place on planet Earth. So that's, that's why I use that as a reference location. So what this shows you is Boulder, uh, um, the, the, the frequency is going to be used at K-band and X-band, that this is its location. This is the height above sea level, which isn't exactly right, 16. Yeah, it is. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, so anyway, it then takes this value and plugs it into the link scenario planner to tab three. And, and then immediately, when you change this value, the uh, rain model will say, oh, you want the rain model for, he for that location, and it, and it produces that and stuffs it into the spreadsheet, okay? So the whole point for this is I, I had some, here's like the workstations we use. Here's the spots for KSAT, if you know that, those guys. And these were just other random ones that came about. But you guys will want to fill in your own. And I've got up to 19 of them plugged in here. So once you plug these in, you can select 19. And it will give you the values for it. And of course, there's no data in it right now. But once you put the data in, that data will come up and it will be put in into the system. Oh, OK. OK. Right. That allows you to figure out the effects of rain between two locations. That's really cool. So this, yeah, this is new. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This was new. Uh, this was done for the last commercial upgrade, but I realized it'd be extremely useful if you put all the places where, you know, the, the, the biggest users of the system were located. Like, you know, you put W5 so-and-so here and, and, and so on until you've got a, a suitable list of places which include dry places and wet places and more if you know where the most of the users are you want to put in more p data points around those users and then it will tell you the effects of rain and trust me that rain is a big deal here the, the, it will affect these links but it's part of the fun of playing this game you know like if you're if you're working 20 meters you, you really care about what what the um what the mean free path is and what frequency MUF the max usable frequency is if you're working 20 meters you care about that um, if you're working 10 meters it's even more important so all of amateur radio with respect to propagation is a gameplay and that is no different with millimeter wave I think it's exciting because amateurs will learn so much about r rain losses from what's going on here so the, yeah. One of the benefits of amateur radio here is when you learn about new phenomena and meteor scatter is a perfect example of where hands were the best meteor scatter guys around. They could tell you more about meteorite propagation than any specialist in the entire world. So it's a place where we can shine. So I love the fact that the, that the rain plays a game with you here. Yeah, and it allows this, is, people, uh, this is exciting because it's so often uh, presented to us as, as just a negative. Yeah, so we can sell that as saying it and compare it to like meteor propagation and how amateurs led that, that, that intellectual field during the time when me, uh, meteor ionization was being investigated by physicists. It's the same kind of thing. It's where we can play in the game. And they put us on uh, 24.05 gigahertz is right on a, a, a maximum uh, rain loss line, line structure. You know, it's, it, 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 it's a peak in, in, in the spectrum. And that's why they gave it to us, because nobody else wanted it. <laughs> so I figure we might as well use it to advantage. And so this is kind of the reason I put this particular yeah. page in, is we can, we can play games with that and see how 
This is actually what difference it makes, guys, if you do that. Okay, the next one's the standard gobbledygook. You got to put in the mean uplink frequency and the mean downlink frequency. And this just displays the bandwidth, the path losses. It's a summary to give you the elevation angles. Again, almost every data sheet it gives the, the slant range, you know, everything you need to know about the link. If, if you've got a bandwidth, it's also telling you the upper edge of the band and the lower edge of the band here. Uh, so if you modify the beam width in this channel, it gives you all the right numbers there. So it's just a handy spreadsheet uh, thing to yeah. have there. Yeah, very good. All right. All right, now we get on to the serious stuff. This is how I set up the transponder. So this is the page that sets up the transponder. I probably won't go into a lot of detail here, but again, remember I only changed the blue values. So what I've got, and this you'll find, of course, not, not a big surprise, is one of the most critical parameters in the whole system is what is the, the maximum transmit power. Um, and uh, Wally, to your, to, to your discussion about uh, Intermod and things like that, I can set in the output back off that I use. And then depending on how much I back it off, the, uh, the transmitter DC to RF power efficiency will change. So if I put three in here, this is gonna drop down to like 20%, but the Intermod will get better. So you have to, you have to know for your SSPA or HPA, that you're using, what the what the like the one dB compression output power is, how much you want to back it off, at that back off point, what is the efficiency? Because it's also going to tell you how much spacecraft power you need on the final page. It tells you, okay, you mean this many rot, watts if you run and run the system this way, right? And then it you have to measure probably either the no noise power ratio version of the Intermod or the third order Intermod products, whatever you wanna do and you, you can represent that there. But that's actually used in the final to actually subtract off the power that's creating the Intermod from the useful power of the transmitter. So it's actually used uh, in, in, this, in, this, uh, in this system to, uh, to offset the power that, that's wastefully used in producing Intermod. All right, so it's telling you here, okay, so this system with those parameters, it's gonna take you 35.7 watts to run that 10 watt transmitter, okay? Then over here, it allows you, you can change, uh, but these two parameters are, are adjusted on it, uh, put in at another page. This is put in in the uh, tab three link scenario planner and this is also put in in the link scenario planner. So this is just reflected here. I've got one channel and that channel is one megahertz wide. I'm using it adaptively, which is a, 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 a bit of a lie. I, you can, this isn't used anywhere. It's just a helpful thing to you to tell you how you're actually adapting. It could be variable, adaptive or constant or fixed. You know, whatever you want to put in there, you can, but it, it it, it, it also can be used for modulation. So if it's BPSK or QPSK, you can put that in there. And then if you have multiple channels, it will divide up the channels into the number of megahertz or, or kilohertz per channel and the uh, uh, allocated power to a given channel. That's for one user in the channel. And then uh, it will also ca calculate the guard band if things don't go in evenly. Stuff, to, stuff like that. Okay, uh, it will tell you the, again, it repeats the bandwidth of the, the low end and the high end of the, of the pass band in both the up and the down link. Then um, it shows you a little pictogram of what the transponder looks like, and it gives you uh, the ability to change all these parameters. So without, I think without belaboring the obvious, the one that you're gonna be most interested in generally, uh, here's by the way, where you put the antenna pointing loss. And it's telling me that's coming from another data sheet too. That's over in the orbit, uh, 4A in the orbit, it allows you to set the pointing loss. Um, but the one you're gonna care about is the, I, I, ha I have two antennas in my version of the system. And this one for the uplink is a lens-aided horn. It has a 
that doesn't sound right. That's not right. It's not 27 degrees, is it? I think that I think that the beam width is a little narrower than that. It's about Earth. It's about Earth size, so it's about 20 degrees, and it has a gain of 21.8. I think I've got a bug there. Uh, then you can set all of the all of the usual things that you tap, set for the noise that's establish the system noise temperature for the system. And then over here on the transmit side, it's telling you, yeah, you you picked up before you picked up 10 watts. Then it, it allows you to have filter losses and line losses going to that. And it says your antenna gain is 17.2. This one has a 16 degree beam width and uh, I again have a pointing loss, which is given by one of the other spreadsheets, uh, but I've got in there for the pointing loss allowed one dB. That gives me a net ERP of 26 dB, and it also calculates uh, for those who care about things like this, the G over T. Okay, so the pointing so, loss, the pointing loss that you're talking about right there was is entered in and on 4A. Uh, let me see. Let's go to it. It's entered in on 4A cell K36. Okay. So 4A cell K36. Oh, it's taken from there, but the, if this is what, if this is a double indirect K36. Okay. And that's a complicated formula. It's saying, I gotta remember my, this is, this is when you forget this, it's called bit rot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I, I know for a fact that, in fact, let's skip to the, to the reality yeah, let's, here. We'll, so we'll, uh, it's got to be, tent. yeah, it's got to come from somewhere. So we'll, we'll table it. And, and oh, it, it does. It, it does. I mean, I, I can cheat and go to the, to the, to the link itself. Uh, let me, let me do say the uplink. And you'll see that now this is, if nothing else, this should be fairly clear. This is the straightforward link ah, link yeah. itself. And if I come down here and I look, the uh, ground station antenna pointing loss. So I got the ground station antenna pointing loss, but I also have the spacecraft pointing loss here. Spacecraft receiver pointing loss is here. K37, so it's telling me it's, so it's it's based on, on a calculation of some uh, some relative, I'll take an action item on this and, and explain to you how it's done that. It gets, it's flummoxing me right now, but okay. um, uh, let's go then back to here. So we're, we're still calculating, but you see there's a lot more, no, okay, here it is, here it is. <laughs> okay, so the, this is, this is to properly define the antennas, now you'll see, we have our friend over here, this, this, this graphic again, because it's useful in, in setting these to see what it does. What we got is a frequency of thus and so. If the antenna, now this assumes a, a, a guys, this is like what kind of, every antenna is gonna have a different kind of equation to set its gain rel, relative to, and its beam width relative to some, parameter of the antenna. So just assume that this is a dish that I'm doing. It's the size of the dish that I would need with this aperture efficiency uh, in order to produce this gain and it has this beam width. So I was right on the beam width, okay. So an antenna that's 70 centimeters across at 10.5 gigahertz and there is no, there is no, uh, you know, there's no uh, parabola. There's no dish that's going to have an 80% aperture efficiency. A good high one would be 60 couple percent. So this is telling me this is a horn antenna. They have about 80% efficiency, and their aperture size isn't that different from. So this is a little bit of a fudge. But what you want to do is get the approximate antenna parameters between the antenna diameter, If it, it, call it the equivalent of a dish and it, the equivalent of a dish aperture efficiency such that it comes out to meet the gain you know for your horn. So I know I have a horn with 17 dB of gain and I bump this up until I get that gain 
And then I say, well, it's a horn, not a dish, so it'll have an effective aperture efficiency of about 80%. So that's how that little tool works. And then you've got the same tool over here uh, for the downlink, but of course the down, sorry, the uplink, and it is occurring at 24 gigs, whereas the downlink is occurring over here at 10.5 gigs. So I've defined the antennas at this point. All right. Now, once I define them, I used another tool I developed a long time ago. And I say, OK, if I put that antenna in and I assume a, a sine squared theta over theta squared, which is what you would call the standard linear taper beam pattern for a, a dish antenna. And it works real well for a horn antenna, too. OK, so this is the angle from bore site over here in this column. And sorry, this is the angle from bore site in this column. And this is how much the beam rolls off. So this is the. Uh, Transmit, this is the transmit antenna beam. And what it's saying is this is the roll off you get in, in, in uh, dB for this particular angle. And you can see that the 3 dB beam width of this antenna is 13.5 Sorry, right. at 13.54 degrees total beam width, the, that's the half power beam width of this antenna. The antenna is rolled off by 3 dB. And, and I did it wrong. So let me try it one more time. The 13.54 degrees is from the bore site to the user location. And if that angle was 13.5 degrees, then the user would be rolled off on, on that antenna by 3, 3 dB. The yellow line so is actually. That, that would be the half beam width. Yeah, it's the half beam width. That's right. It's the half. It's, it's, it's one half the half power beam width. Oh, you see, it's there. Half power beam divided by two. So it's a half power beam width divided by two. That's correct. So that's the, from the bore site to where the user might be located. Now, what this yellow line, this is a dynamic yellow line. This is, this is, using, dyna this is using dynamic color control. Uh, and this is one of the new features I've been able to thread into this. For this link, the yellow line is the condition I'm meeting right now on the uplink. OK, so at this time, uh, I'm, this is the closest step that I, I, I'm achieving that I have in this step. So it's, a, it's like a lookup. It, it, it isn't like a lookup table. It is a lookup table. And it's looked up and said, OK, you're at 7.98 degrees off, 7 point something degrees off. And that, this is the closest step. And you're, the closest step is you are losing 1 dB in performance by being at that location. So you're inside the 3 dB beam width in transmit. However, over here in the receive side, we got a different situation. The half power beam width is, is 8 degrees, not 13 and a half. So it's a narrower antenna. And because it's a narrow antenna, I'm already, I've already, the, what I'm achieving at 8.02 degrees is I'm achieving minus 3.03. .03. So I'm already just slightly past the 3 dB roll off point on the antenna. So as I change the link parameters, this yellow line dynamically moves up and down the page. It's telling you where the user is relative to the beam pattern. And as we move off, what we'll see as we go down here, look what happens if the beam pattern moves down to this area, which it very well will. I, I, I'll have a loss of, uh, of infinity in dB. Yeah, wow. I mean, 328 dB. So that's, you're in the null. And so, Dude, when you're in that null, you're not going to communicate. So that user, the ring all around, for whatever elevation angle corresponds to that case, all the way around that ring, uh, around the Earth, centered on uh, the Earth center, 
there's not going to be any communications. So you have to you have to sort of plan how how that works in the way the system where where you are in the orbit and that kind of thing. There will be times where certain elevation angles will have will be in a null scenario. And there'll be some cases where I'll actually be able to perform and the link will close all the way out in the first side load. So yeah. we, we can show, we can show some of the cases here, but you have to be aware of the fact that as you move away from apogee, if the beam can't adapt, that, then two things happen. One is you're going to be, the user will be, just on average, the user will be further off the beam bore site. And second of all, to the good side, you the spacecraft will be closer to the Earth. So one over R squared is a lower path loss. So the link will just improve because the path loss decreased. So all that is figured out in this, this link model here. Sounds great. All right. Um, let's see. So we that finishes with the user, uh, sorry, the spacecraft setup. Once you've done that, you've set up everything you can, and then you have to go to the users. And this is a lot more easy to figure out. If, if you play with this antenna here, and I say yes, then it will apply to the link equations, the link budget, this antenna, which has this gain and this beam width. If I select no here, it goes over and it will select the gain that you've picked off that other choice on the link scenario planner. Let me do that real quick. There is up here at the top in the link scenario planner, you can check this box and uncheck these boxes. And then you'll be using that particular size antenna. And I, this is a little bit complex, I agree. And you'll be controlling from this box here. But you see, it tells me I've not selected this. If I say no, then it says select it over here and not select it over here. If I say yes, it swaps them around. Selected, not selected. And if, again, I say no, no, and I go over to the link scenario planner, it will have changed the check boxes. These two become... Oh, that's interesting. Actually, I, you, I have to. Think you have I have to, to select enter. no on the other one too. I have to select no on the other one too, and that's correct. So I have to go down here and say, nope, I'm not going to use this antenna. Now I'm operating in what you might call a uh, a duplexer diplexer mode, where I, I have the same antenna and it goes through to a diplexer, and you sort the transmit frequency in there receive frequency in the diplexer, and then you've got two coax cables, one going to the transmitter, one going to the receiver. So you can do either mode of, of performance here. You can have the, assume the user has two antennas or one antenna, yeah, and that's, that's how you- That's pretty trick. That's, and it's, it is not, not it, there could be a, there could be an explanation here. <laughs> Eventually. Oh, there is, yeah, yeah. there is, uh, let me see. It's, is there is like the notes on the page probably oh there it is okay yeah thank you i, I try and put all, all these notes and, and by the way gotta use the notes sometimes to figure out what's going on yeah Let's yeah see. that's pretty trick though that's a tremendous amount of customization here's the here's the key key one okay yeah all right so uh, we got the the user terminal sorted. So I I can what I did here in, in in now going back to not how you might use the spreadsheet, but how I am using the spreadsheet is I put a one meter antenna in for transmit and receive, so I could play with these parameters while I was doing it, uh, and I've got uh, sixty percent aperture efficiency would be like an offset fed user antenna. So I assume that the, the user is using a microwave antenna he would have bought from his TV dish store where he, he, where he would get it and then he modifies the feed for his use. Yeah. Uh, but, but basically it's an offset fed antenna. So it's a little tricky to point for the average user because of course 
it doesn't the, the, the boresight doesn't align with any physical feature on the dish. So it's hard as hell to make sure. You can't just go out with your eye and look at some reference point in the sky like a star and say, okay, I'm about right. <laughs> you, got, you got to calibrate your system. But, but anyway, that's what's in here right now is the cheapest antenna I could get for a guy was a offset fed one meter dish. And it already has a beam width at our frequency of 0.87 degrees, which is damn narrow. And the same, and the same size antenna down here for the user on the downlink, which goes, Michelle, to the to the issue of if I make it easier for receive than transmit, then he can slop around in two degrees. <laughs> right. Which is still pretty damn narrow. But he can slop around in two degrees rather than having to try and point to 0.87 degrees, which he needs for transmit. Right. Also, with transmit, he might be able, if you put the right feature, software feature in the spacecraft, he might be able to walk him, himself in if he gets feedback from the spacecraft saying, okay, your signal and noise ratio right now in the channel I'm receiving you on using some GUI or something is, you know, is, is 6 dB. Oh, no, now it's 8. Oh, it's 9. Okay, so, so he uses that to walk it in. He can walk in the transmit. Whereas he needs the feedback he gets from his receiver to, uh, to, to lock in the downlink beam. Right. And I assume there's going to be some kind of beacons here and there. We, we haven't talked about frequency referencing and all that. And, and that's a whole other yeah. chapter. No, we, in this it, it is. It's a whole other sure. chapter. And we do have some, some work there and uh, some, some uh, engineering and some ideas. Yeah. So this is the area for the ground station where you put in whatever the LNA temperature is, uh, uh, noise figure. I don't have it. If you want, I can put in noise figure here. And I've got a little calculator. I can put a little calculator over here in the empty space, which allows you to go from noise figure to noise temperature and noise temperature because hams are de needing that all the time. So we can do that. But anyway, I've, I've got it in proper engineering terms. So it's, it's noise yeah. temperature. If you have a filter like a bandpass filter, typically losses you want to get below a dB, and then whatever your transmission line lines, you want this all very close to the feed so you get this loss down. We all know that. But anyway, that's where you enter the parameters. Uh, here's where the pointing loss of the of the ground station transmitter goes, and this gets fed into the uh, link budget. And it's good to know at any given frequency roughly what the clear sky sky temperature is. Right. And that will be very much elevation angle dependent. So the way my link budget works, it assumes kind of a constant value for that. And even in a clear sky, actually, that does vary a little bit. So I call that a fudge factor. And I, what I have in there is my best guess at the fudge factor for, for that frequency and mean, medium elevation angle. Okay, so that's uh, blue. That means that, that that's the responsibility of the of the user of the yeah. Any, anything that's blue here is expected. You've got to fill it in, and it will affect the link budget. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So then we go to the links proper, and this should look like a properly documented and annotated uh, link budget. And the most important part of it, it do, it looks pretty much regularly. Like you'd expect to see, it's got all the pointing losses. It's properly computing, and a, and a parameter you need to know uh, is the uh, axial ratio of the antennas you're using. So you'll see where the hell is my axial ratio? Up here. Polar. Polarization loss. Okay, that's a big, big one. This, uh, it's the main spreadsheet that where you have to put the polarization loss. You guys, from some of my other, either get one of my other uh, regular amateur radio spreadsheets, or uh, you can implement the formula yourself. But you need to know the axial ratio of the transmit antenna, the axial ratio of the receive antenna, and then the angle between the two ellipses that are created by the two antennas when their axial ratios aren't perfect. And what this is telling me is that the axial ratio of the ground station antenna was one dB, the spacecraft antenna was three dB, and, the, and the, it's the worst case ellipse alignment. So the two ellipses thus created are in, in as cross poles as they can get. 
And under those conditions where I have a one in three, the, the, the uh, loss is minus 0.23. But that is a, a, a user entry. And I, I realized that my, I've got lots of spreadsheets that calculate that, but I didn't put it here. And if a user is going to use this, he'd, he'd benefit from having this be an equation. But for big guys like us using this, I'm assuming you, you would know how to either calculate that or estimate it for what your system is. But the polarization losses to a lot of people is a big deal these days. And so that's where you play with it. Okay. Um, and I wanted you to know that I, I do take into account in the, well, uh, that's a downlink issue. So let's just stick with the uplinks. Uh, I don't deal with the, the linearity of the user uh, on this link, Wally. The user's uh, IMR, intermod ratio or, or intermod losses is not really taken into account. I'm assuming that the ground station takes account of that in the transmit power here. So that's... <laughs> Uh, One higher level of sophistication I could add here that I haven't. However, I take care of that on the transmit side of the spacecraft. Yeah, on the downlink side, does it make sense to stick a implementation loss catch-all? Um, it's a good idea to put that parameter in there if it's you if it's fairly if the implementation loss across the mod cod steps is fairly consistent then i i could it could be easily put as just before the bottom line of the link budget on the downlink if it changes by mod cod step then you have to put it into the mod cod table we haven't gotten to that yet okay all right so anyway so this is just everything standard except what i'm doing here is i'm allowing you to uh pick between I'm separately, once we get into the part where the, the, the rain losses occur, all the rain losses, which are coming from the, the, the rain model, are plugged in here. And, and these are the sums of them. And then I, from here on down the link budget, I compute the, the rain case, the rain on case, and the rain off case. And that's what you, you see, these two parallel numbers. You see them again here, and here, and here. Um, so each time I apply some correction, there is two versions of the of the outcome, and they're carried. And then I copy. If I turn on the rain, it copies the worst value. If I turn the rain off, it takes the best value. In in each case, but the things I correct for here are uh, the those the met losses. Um, let's see. This this is where I've computed the net effect. This is the number I would nominally use to do the mod cod table lookup. In other words, this is the end result of the link, except I haven't yet accounted for um, noise power in the in the receiver, and I haven't yet accounted for um, interference interference on the downlink. If I've got an adjacent, if I've got an interfere or an interference environment, I mean, let's say I have something that's producing white noise that's going all over my receiver channel, I can put in the density of that noise here and it, and it computes the noise power of that. And then it figures out how much does that degrade the link? Okay. Oh, okay. And yeah, it, for, well, for that case, but that's uh, like, if you want to see it go worse, I go minus 200. Okay, and you see the link goes to crap because I've, I've put a very high, uh, that's a fairly high interference density into that case, into that scenario. Um, then I, I end up with the classic signal to noise ratio. That, that's, okay, it's, but it's the signal to noise ratio kit considering the noise also includes an interference, and that interference is defined by that blue box above. So if I turn off the interference so that it's really 
C over N plus I, but I is zero, then it becomes C over N. Anyway, that is the, the bottom line as far as putting it in terms of signal noise in a given bandwidth. There's the, the bandwidth. So I come up with the, the net of, so that's in the, in the transponder. And then this is in the, the user's receiver. And since they're identical, it doesn't change. And then um, I have a clear sky and a uh, sometimes called unfaded and faded clear sky and uh, C over N zero plus I zero. So I take that, that one into, into account. And that is actually the number here that I'm using in the, in the ModCod lookup table. And I also calculate uh, for the DVBS2 table, if some people would like to know what the net EB over N0 parameter is. It's another way of saying the signal to noise ratio, but it's the energy per bit to noise power density number. And yeah. so that's given here as well. No, yeah. Okay. So um, th this part down here is where I, here is a, there is an implementation loss taken into consideration here. Um, but I am, since I've essentially disabled everything down here because I'm, I'm going on to the, to the, the mod cod tables and I'm using a, a DVBS2 demodulator. So fundamentally, I, I, I haven't really used this, but here's an example of where I put the implementation loss. Uh, into the into the link. So prior use of this spreadsheet, I was apparently using it for a BPSK link, and I had assumed that the DMAT had a, a half dB implementation loss. Okay. Okay. Now, if, if we go to the downlink, uh, the only thing that might be different here that you haven't seen before is I calculate from the inner mod value that's in here. I calculate the inner mod power. So I say, okay, I got a 10 watt transmitter, but I'm producing uh, the intermods 20 dB down, say. So I have an intermod of 0.1 dB. So that's 20 dB below 10 watts. So I'm losing to the intermod 0.1 of a dB. So the real power I'm actually transmitting on the link that's doing some good at the D mod is 9.9 .9 watts. So if I were, for instance, to go back and make the inner mod value, which I think is all the way back here. Uh, yeah, it's the spacecraft inner mod, isn't it? Here's the spacecraft inner mod. If I make it the like a class C amplifier or something where it's really crappy, you'll see now what happens. Now the downlink, which is still 10 watts, is losing one watt of power to the inner mod and it's only producing nine watts of real power. So nine watts now goes through the link all the way to the other end. Okay. Yeah, but if the trade-off is efficiency, there may be, that may you be bet. a worthwhile way to go. In that, in that regard, you have to know what the efficiency hit is for a given intermod. So if I measure 15, and, and so it'll also, the way you will adjust that normally, and the big guys, when they do their transponders, they just have a variable attenuator and they set an attenuator and that will set the output back off. So if I back it off, say 3 dB, then I'm, I might have improved linearity. So I might get say 25 dB linearity. So I've got that trade off but I now only have five watts of power driving the link, but it's a much more linear link. And by the way, this, in the bargain, this number, if I went to a higher output back off, the efficiency might go down to like 20%. So that might be the, the circumstances for a fairly linear transponder with a pretty big back off. And I don't know if that's enough back off to get 25 dB. That might have to be 6 dB or something like that. But anyway, the, you'll pay for it with efficiency. Now you can go see how it affects the links and you can see that my transponder power has gone up to 50 Watts. So to get 10 Watts out, I now need 50 Watts of power in to make that system work. So I'll go back to what I had, which is it's a 10 Watt transmitter. It's uh, output back off was about 
1.7 dB. I can't write 1.76. The transmitter DC at RF efficiency was 28% at about 20 dB in remote. Okay. So with that discussion, this link looks a lot like the other one. Um, there, here's all the rain effects, and you can see the rain effects are much smaller because this is at 10 gigs and so on. And the same things apply here. And there's the net result in, in uh, C over N plus I. And the, the numbers I really care about are these two numbers here, the C over N zero plus I zero. That's what I'm using in, in, in the mod card tables. Now, this is the uplink mod card table. You'll notice there's a yellow line across here, and this means this is the mod cod step that the link was able to achieve. So I I look over here at the red number and I see. Uh, by the way, are you guys generally familiar with what these mod cod tables look like? This is right out of the Etsy DVBS2 standard. Where you you should say we are intimate with them. Okay, cool. So so. Um, this is uh, what I've made adjustable here is I, I can see I've got a 5% a, a Ny, Nyquist roll off. So this is a very, very sharp filter. And uh, I might say for an amateur application, you might be able to use 10 or even 20% Nyquist roll off and nobody would care. And it would save uh, probably power at the, at, the, at the microprocessor that's making this filter exist. I assume it'd be a a software defined radio and the sharper the filter the more recursive steps that the, the filtering process takes within the software and it usually no, chews up FFT, so it doesn't matter okay 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 all right but but anyway uh there's usually a trade space around using that parameter but to be honest if we're at 24 gigahertz nobody's going to care how efficiently we use it but if you want to DVB S2X is certainly supporting 5% Nyquist roll off. Here we're using 5%, but I, I, I'm i going to change that. I don't like that. I think 15 uh, and 20 is the limit on S2. Yeah, I think 15 or 20 is it. So I've, I've over specified that one. So you're right. Um, and, and so, okay, so that now changes my, uh, my the, the allowable symbol rate. Because what I've actually said here is the hard channel limit. And then it says, well, how many at, at that at that Nyquist roll off, how many uh, symbols can I actually cram into that 10 kilohertz channel? So now I can get 8.7 kilobits, kilosymbols in that channel. Anyway, the mod pod uh, that was achieved was this particular step. And you'll see that what I did and this is an artifact of the fact that I was using these commercially, but we had a case where we had the uplink was an S using the S2 standard and the downlink used the S2X standard, which it meant it used all the S2 steps, but also all of the S2X ones. And I'll, I'll show you that on the downlink. And I figured here, it's also true that the uplink doesn't need that much partitioning on the part of the users. Whereas I'd like to get every bit out of the downlink I could because the downlink is the hard one and the uplink was the easier one, even though it was at, at, at 24 gigahertz. So what you guys are gonna tell me is I'm gonna replace this table with a table that's gonna have your mod cut steps, which aren't gonna look like this, but I need the data for to create this table. I think S2 okay. is a good starting point for this. Yeah, so S2 is a pretty good starting point because your list is gonna be somewhere within this list. Yes, yeah, for sure. And maybe you'll be a little less efficient uh, because maybe you don't have as good a coding or something, but that's well, what it is, whatever it is, it is. This is pretty close yeah. to the best performance for APSK. We may not be able to do the, the, non, the linear codes depending on the output but, stage. But you, you can see that if I drop down to some of the other steps here, Oh yeah, uh, data rate. Yeah, 
well, well, I'm actually talking about case case where the where the case is the where you are around the orbit. Actually, if I go down in altitude, I don't always improve the situation because of the beam roll off. So some users in some circumstances are going to get worse conditions, even though they're getting closer to the Earth, which is a a sad outcome, but it's it's part of it. it's part of what I call the game because there is a game here, and and you just have to as an amateur, you're not going to get everything perfect because you got it all for free. <laughs> so you have to get what you get, and 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 that's part of the fun of the whole thing, and that's kind of the way I look at these uh, these antenna roll offs and things like that as well. Okay, so this is the whole downlink list, and you can see we can go from a mod cut step of one to twenty eight. There happen to be 28 steps here. And that takes you all the way up to 32 APSK 9 tenths and all the way down to QPSK 1 quarter. And if you're at QPSK 1 quarter, that should be about, you know, in your mental mind, you'd say, well, QPSK, I, I, I divide by two, uh, I multiply by two, and by doing half a quarter rate, I, 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 I divide by four. So that the total should be about 0.5. And you can see, give or take, bit sampling issues and overheads, it's 0.49 is the bit per symbol efficiency of that step. Whereas if I can go all the way up to 32 to APSK, I can all, I'll go, go all the way up to four and a half bits per symbol. I just, I wanted to say that this is actually um, the extended steps no, no, that, this is just the normal steps. That's, yeah, that's a standard table from DVB. That's, that's the standard table. And this other table is one that's also in the data standard, the Etsy standard, but it's a, a, a somewhat different table. And what we've done is we've automated that. So it's this has got all kind of conditional things in it, the way I'm using it. Okay, so... Um, that's that's it for that. Okay, so what happens is that um, there's a lookup table where it compares this value 45.81. We go back to the down. Let's see, this is the downlink budget. Yeah, yeah, this is the uplink budget. Okay, so I go back to the uplink budget, and I see the number I got. The number I achieved with rain off was 45.89. So it takes the 45.89 and it looks, doing the lookup, it says the, the number which I ex exceeded but didn't get to the next step was 45.81. So I got 45.89 and I need 45.81. So I've got a little bit of margin, but that's the closest step. So it picks that step. So it's a lookup table. Um, so the downlink one, now you'll see I've, what one thing, I've, first of all, you see it's bigger, <laughs> a lot bigger. Yeah, and that, if, and this was what happens if you allow in your decoder, uh, de demodulator, de yeah, decoder, demodulator, if you allow every single step in the S2X group and the old S2 group. So if, if you allow all those to occur, and we have a piece of, uh, of uh, equipment at work we're building, which does that. So I put in all the mod cut steps and I highlighted the S2X ones just so you can know, well, did I land on one of the old steps or one of the new steps? Because we're actually comparing some old hardware to some new hardware, so that's why it's highlighted like this. But at least you can tell. And you can see on the downlink here with what we've done, uh, we've got now a uh, allowable uh, data rate of 2.25 megabits per second. Let me go back to the planner and see. Uh, so I changed something pretty big time. So now you can see if I look at my measure, whatever I've done, I don't know why I've gotten that big. Uh, I, I'm getting 360 channels uh, worth of, of, of use out. So I, I'm doing really well here. And I'm wondering, did I tra the transmitter power is still 10 watts, 1.7, 20 dB. 
Hmm. Did I make the user better? Uh, let's see. Am I? Oh, I, I got something wrong here. Uh, I'm using that one, and I want to use this one. So this wants to be a yes. From that much antenna gain there. Uh, so now. My down link. Now I'm back where I thought I should be. So I had too much uplink antenna gain. Uh, and so now this is what I'd expect. I've got just around about a bit per hertz and I'm getting just 100.9 megabits per second of performance out of that link. I want The next thing I want to show you is how, now how the RAIN model is working here. Um, so it actually uses the rain model twice, and this is what the rain model GUI thing that the ITU sends you looks like. You can see it's the ITU here because how there's spelling degrees <coughs> in French. All the green parameters are plugged in. So I'm taking from that user selection, I'm plugging in his latitude, longitude, height, and whatever elevation angle is taken from that the orbit data sheet. I put in his downlink antenna size, which is also taken from tab three, uh, and the uh, antenna efficiency, uh, the frequency. This polarization parameter doesn't seem to work the way I, uh, I thought it was. So I just put 45 in there and leave it alone. I think it's assuming uh, a linear antenna and that it's a geo case and so they're assuming that the polarizations are misaligned 45 degrees, I don't know. And then it wants the rain unavailability and the one most everybody uses is the link, link rain ability, availability, not the unavailability. So uh, this is copied from the, uh, the tab three, the uh, link scenario planner and is put here. It then computes that number there and then that's what the what the IT rain model is actually doing. Then it says, okay, if you have that location, that frequency, that elevation angle, and that set of antenna parameters, here's what your uh, here's what your uh, weather looks like. And, and so it gives you for 99.5% of the time, if if the link was only available a half percent of the time, it would be raining pretty hard. So the rain would be 35 millimeters of rain an hour. Um, I don't know what that next parameter is. It tells you the mean height of the rain. It tells you how many, how many uh, along a, a, a one meter column, it's telling you what the weight of the rain would be in that column. And it's 0.35 of a kilogram. It's telling you surface water vapor densities and integrated water, all these things that meteorologic, meteorologists would uh, ask about. And then it's telling you also, well, okay, in a, in a uh, radio sense, the, the effective temperature of that, of that whole environment you're in is 280 degrees Kelvin. And then the net effect of that on the link is it has, Two parameters for gaseous uh, attenuation. The number you're supposed to use is the is this latter one. So th that's really the effective uh, gas loss. So at this frequency, which is 24.025 gigahertz, at in Boulder, Colorado, you can expect without any rain or anything, just the atmosphere is going to kill 4.75. Uh, dB of your signal going in the uplink direction. And if you, you know, on top of that, have rain and clouds, you get this additional part. And then there's something called scintillation. I, I think scintillation is a fudge factor, but okay, let's leave it in there. But, but the ITU says you can have scintillation on any frequency and it's like noise that the atmosphere produces that that mucks up your 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 link and it has certain noise statistical parameters and i really have never very well understood it 
but it's essentially atmospherically generated specific kind of noise. The way I like to think of it is, well, if I've got that much additional attenuation, then maybe I'm not uncertain about by about the same amount. So you can call it what you want, but it throws another dB into the mix. And then um, the one you're supposed to use is number two here. So we have for Boulder, Colorado on a clear day, we got at this 10 degree elevation angle, we already have a, almost 12 dB of losses. So that's pretty, pretty bad. But if we go to clear sky conditions and we only count the, uh, the gases attenuation and um, the scintillation, you see we get something like 5.86 dB. So with the rain off, we only have 5.8 dB, but with the rain on, it's nearly 12 dB of losses. And by the way, another useful number here is if I look up in the sky with those conditions, that's the temperature of the sky. Remember I said if at medium elevation angles you didn't have any effects of the atmosphere, the, the sky would look like about 35 Kelvin. What they're saying is, what, what the ITU says is, if you're looking at 10 degrees, that's the temperature you see. And so that number can then be used in, as the, the other temperature parameter you use in calculating the system noise temperature. Well, that'll have a big effect on the downlink. Yeah. Um, let, let's, I mean, for instance, I mean the uplink. Yeah, let's, for instance, go to the orbit. Okay, I've got an elevation angle here, and now let me make it be 45 degrees. All I'm changing for the link is just the guy's elevation angle. Now, that's already fed into that link model back there for the uplink. Now, it's by going up to 45 degrees, the noise temperature has dropped down to 168, and the overall uh, atmospheric losses plus scintillation has gone down to 4 dB. And without any rain or anything, it's dropped down to 1.37 dB. So now it's become a kind of a useful radio link. Okay, now, now it works fine. But it's telling you that down at 10 degrees, that user is gonna, gonna struggle, and that, that's something you got to fig figure out when you figure out what how you're going to set up the transponder to make it easier or harder for uh, that user to go uh, to access the transponder. So by setting up the transponder conditions, you can actually set what elevation angle practically the average user will be able to get down to before he'll lose the link. And of course, if he's in a wetter location, it's going to be, he's going to have to have a higher elevation angle before he can play. Whereas if he gets, you know, uh, a higher elevation angle and he's in a drier place, he's going to do better. So all those things one would pr in principle need to param parameterize in order to be able to do the transponder setup the way you'd really like to have it. All right, sounds good. All right, and the last thing is a summary thing that shows you the results, and then that's just there's no changes in that, but it it breaks things up by what the user's parameters are on the uplink, on the downlink, and then what the spacecraft parameters are. So that's all summarized there. And then if I can get this last one, and then here's a pretty picture that shows what everything looks like as you go through the system from one end to the other. And the last one doesn't count. So great stuff. I think I think you can see where the trade spaces are here. And I, I see some trade spaces very clearly, of course, for uh, due to rain. Uh, and whether you have the rain on or off. Um, and it's a very strong function of the, regardless of where the user is located, his average elevation angle. And I think you can see that the, the link, the overall system performance, how many channels of users you can support where each channel 
in my definition was a voice grade channel. I use that 6.25 parameter, but that can be a different parameter, of course. But in order to get 100 channels for the users over the whole range of different parameters, which you can change here. Um, well, it's really, it's really hard. We'll, we'll have a baseline everybody can do probably P, uh, QPSK one quarter, maybe sure. a half. And that will be a, a low power, 2,400 bit per second. Everybody has that capability, but they may not be able to receive anything that's above QPSK one quarter, which is fine. Yeah. So, so, but by having a tool like this, you can you can play with all those parameters and you can make certain sort of <laughs> statistical judgments about the user community, right. like exactly. yeah, every, average antenna size, average ERP of the user. How big? I I assumed here uh, that our power was pretty hard, but you know what? Because of gallium nitride these devices are getting better all the time. So it's getting it might easier, be, easier and easier. Yeah, it <laughs> changes, it changes almost monthly. <laughs> and, do, and so 20, 24 gigahertz on the ground is easy. Yeah, well, so whatever you want to assume there, I've assumed that uh, we use the old number we used to use maybe five years ago, which was, it's pretty hard. So we, we don't make the user generate more than one watt of RF, but he also wants a small antenna. I'd like to give him a 0.5 meter dish, but instead I gave him a one meter dish um, to make the uplink ERP look better. So, so those are the kind of trades you can make, uh, but do, do realize that where 24 gigs comes into the picture, you've gotta be ever mindful of the mean rainfall. And, Somebody who lives in Mississippi or uh, Louisiana isn't going to like this system as much as somebody in uh, Kansas or, Arizona. you know, uh, Colorado or Arizona. They're just not going to like it because they're going to eat seven or eight dB all the time due yeah. to that, due to that uh, water vapor absorption. Well, I think that's something that will be... Uh appreciated both through the the modeling and through uh actual experience and, and usage it's uh it's right remarkable. part of the fun here is to let people play with the systems they synthesize and come up with and you know how our community works so great to say look you go to a conference look what i did and then everybody else next year will have what that guy had but that <laughs> right. guy's moved on to something else so exactly yeah so it, it is it is interesting that this should stimulate a lot of development work uh, just because it's not a piece of cake. Yeah, I can't wait. Thank you. This is fantastic. Okay, so um, if, you, if you guys want to give me what the user uplink usually looks like, or just maybe send me an email and say, well, this part of your link model isn't applicable because we do things this way or that way. Yeah. Because I, obviously I'm doing it from a system I designed from inside my, my, my cranium here. Yeah. I'll put some details together for you. So, so you can see what our, what our architecture really looks like. Um, we can, you're probably most familiar with CC, um, so you can use that as a baseline. Anything will be close to that. Oh, CCSDS. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, would that be there? Uh, which which standard there? Do you know? Do you remember the number or the oh, title? I think it's the the blue book. But I'll I'll, I'll find I'll dig oh, yeah, it. They're, yeah, they're, they're all blue books. Um, yeah, we'll, but, uh, but, we'll track it down. Sure, sure. Um, but but yeah, then 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 if, if it's a CCSDS, then all the detailed numbers are there and I can plug those yeah, in. Yeah, then you'll have a good idea what the numbers are. Yeah. So in terms of what you guys are assuming for the users, that's maybe the place where I'm the most out of date because I actually haven't pressed a CW key in 
20 years. Um, we're, we're assuming that the user can operate this yep. like it's a walkie-talkie. Okay, like it's a walkie-talkie, but not in terms of the antenna, of course. Right. No, no. Yeah. No, and yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, yeah, we could, user. we could send some some descriptions, um, you know, the the sort of the use cases that we uh, assume, some some of the feedback that we've received and, and what we think will be uh, innovative, uh, fun and easy to use. Yeah. Well, if you guys could could somehow figure out how to get this link model to work uh, and, and Michelle, you're now familiar with the the issue of trying to get this to recognize uh, the IT ring model to recognize 32-bit numbers instead of 64-bit numbers in the in the thing, and I, I, I'm really frustrated with the ITU about this whole thing. But anyway, if we could get the rain model working, then you guys can be you guys too can play with this and change parameters and do what you want. Uh, okay. And I think it's it's pretty educational to. Uh, another thing to play with is what is the optimum antenna beam width for this joint? Uh, you've got a dual dual feed antenna or dual frequency antenna. So what are the yeah. optimum beam widths there for that antenna? That's it's a big trade factor there, I think. Yeah, it is. Um, that's a very good point. Because as you see, as you get closer to the earth, the link doesn't necessarily get better, but you've got two competing factors. The, the beam is... You're, you're, you're rolling off more on the beam, but you're getting closer to the earth. So the, the signal getting, is getting stronger just because of one over R squared. So you got those two competing factors and it's not entirely intuitively obvious right. what the, the absolute best gain of this antenna would be. Right. And that's, both, yeah, that's, uh, that's very exciting. I think this is great. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't, I'd also like to see this with the orbital, orbital parameters for uh, a, a near geo. That'd be well, you can do that now. It, 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 this, this is for geo. What you're looking at is geo because I'm at Apogee and Apogee is geo. Right, right, right. yeah. So, just so all you need to do is, is figure out what the user's elevation would angle would be to that geo station, you know, that, 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 that longitude. And then from that, plug it in, and you'll have the link for that individual. Right. Okay. I've got another spreadsheet that does that kind of math if you want that one. Sure. I've got a geo link model too, but it's where you can put in the Latin one of the of the user A, user B, and then the and then the satellite station, which is its longitude. And then it tells you azimuth elevation and slant range. Okay. Yeah, it, it's mostly the uplink uh, because everybody has to have a downlink or they cannot do anything. Right? Yeah. If they're not receiving the downlink, they're off the air. And one thing you might want to do is consider beacons here. And I, I think maybe because the word beacon has been so so confused by the CubeSat uh, community, I want to define what I mean by beacon. But a subcarrier that's put with the downlink that somebody can use for tuning purposes. And it would be really cool if whatever you decide for the uplink, whatever digital channel you decide could have a mode where that, you know, like there's an alternating one zero pattern the user sends in that mode. And what he gets back is his resultant signal to noise ratio, C over N, C over N zero. Right. Yeah, well, uh, so, we already so he knows whether he's uh, tuned his antenna, he's turning his antenna in the right direction. Yeah, no, yeah. we have modes where, where they can monitor the, all the signal parameters. That's done routinely because when it starts raining, we're going to have to, they're going to have to see that their power is not enough and they're going to have to adjust the power dynamically. That's going to happen all automatically. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, um, there's a there's plenty of room for for really truly uh, fun and different things. Um, you know, like like the yeah. If you if you guys have a a paper on the on the you know sort of the 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 goals of how the transponder would operate, that that could be really interesting. Yes. Yeah, we have some some stuff that's published that walks through the 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 basic concepts of of how it operates, uh, and someone working on a 
more detailed authentication authorization, the, the loop, the acquisition loop. And so we, we do have uh, some written work and Wally is going to uh, really uh, take take that base that we that we have that's currently published and um, really bring it up to um, more complete level uh, here in the very near future. So I can get you some some links to the stuff that's in our repository now, uh, which should be a quick read. Uh, let you see where where we're at, and then uh, Wally will have some some more uh, detailed work uh, coming out soon. Okay, good. Um, how close am I with respect to the size of the antennas for the user and the power level of that user at 24 gigs? Yeah, the I think the antenna size looks reasonable to me. Um, we do have a, a supply of some really nice dishes uh, that we're collecting and moving from one uh, location uh, to a storage location in, in Alabama. Um, so, you know, since we have this supply of of dishes, that may be a good one to start with. I think we have 30. Um, so our plan was how to big, make a how bunch big are those? Of, I think these are a meter. They're a meter dish. They're nice. Okay. I'll, I'll send a data sheet to you. Um, a cool thing to do would be, be if you could measure the beam width of that antenna too exactly. at 24.002 okay. or something. Yeah, we will. Uh, we, uh, we're now at the point where we're able to, to do a little more traveling and for people to be able to move around and move, uh, move this particular uh, set of materials. And we have some larger dishes too um, in, the, in the collection. I think these are six foot, uh, so they're they're pretty pretty large, uh, different. Yeah, two places. meters. Yeah, two-ish meters. Yes, so we we do have some of some of those, um, and that's it for for dishes. But I think the dish size assumptions are good, uh, and I I don't know, Wally, what do you think about the power? Um, it 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 feels right for one for um for for one to two um megabit downlink seems yeah a, a okay. good match yeah, yeah. Not, now you you guys were saying you were thinking of of much higher data rates on the downlink but you can see you're you're very much link limited uh to get too much more i mean you know we're already using the best modulation coding scheme known to man so it's that's not an area you can improve in well, no, so, you can't, um, you can't, you're at you're at basically at Nyquist already. So, yeah, yeah, you are. You're Shannon's starting to speak to you real loud. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so would uh, to get that? Would you up the power to say a different class of spacecraft? So you're using more like 100 watts to generate maybe 20, 25 watts. Yeah, RF I think power? I I think we're we probably. Our base our baseline power level, I think, in in geo needs to be about a hundred, hundred watts. Okay, well that's either a sixteen u, a, a twelve or sixteen u spacecraft, and the launch cost of that's well, going to be the better. It's, it's, of it's, either a very, it's a very clever six u, or or a probably ordinary twelve u. Yeah, there's a there's a group in uh, Boulder actually that uh, I I have worked with who have got this really cool fold up thing, <clears throat> and I would I, I I've tried putting those you know in a, in a cartoon sense in a in a uh, CAD sense into a uh, side of a six U and I can get about. I think I can get about 70, six, maybe somewhere between 50 and 70 watts, but no, uh, bad. gosh, 100, that's, that would be good if you could do that. Yeah, that's the only way we're going to get our power up to uh, our downlinks uh, up much higher than uh, one, one, one to two, because uh, they're going to be down, they're going to be length limited. Right. Rem yeah, well, and, and that's kind of what I'm predicting. And I, I think, again, my metric was if you can't get 100 channels, you can't really call. I think you'd need too many spacecraft otherwise, and therefore it wouldn't be cost effective. You've got to work for something like 100 channels equivalent user. So one channel used by two users is 200 users per spacecraft. 
if you can't get that kind of number on an international system, I don't think it's really very international anymore. No, our, our baseline is 96 channels in the in the okay, we're lo lowest performance mode. Right. Okay. And, you know, 2400 bit per second. But but within okay, so that, the, those channels can be larger if the uplinks can be made, can be closed. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you know, what you what you'll notice, I'm sure before this is over is there will be portions of the orbit which favor uh, good and bad conditions. And it's it's not necessarily driven by the height, the distance from apogee either. It's because of the, the, the you know, the first first nulls of the antennas, you'll you'll probably find that there are, there are spots where on average the users will do better than on on other spots on the orbit and so you can try and adjust the what the users are doing at those times based on that in, in other words there's lots of games to be played here and and while they while those games couldn't be played if you were professionally doing this where you have to Assume a comm link is presented 100% of the time with 99.99% reliability. We don't have to assume that. No, but it's still our target. Well, it'd be nice. And I, th I, th I think if you could do something that's quasi geo, you you could get there. Yeah. And I think you can get arbitrarily close with an NGSO. You just have these antenna problems. Right can't be really avoided. All right, let's uh let's go ahead and call it uh, call it an evening and uh and meet again really soon. I will I have some okay. action items uh written down here and um I'm sure that we will have plenty more to talk about and catch up on. This has been absolutely fantastic and what I'll do is I will edit up the video. Yeah, this is exciting. So I have plenty to do on the document with the documents you sent me, the action items from tonight. And is there anything else that I can do to help uh, make this make this great? Um, no, I don't think so on, on this. Um, but let me know if, um, if you want me to do a, a final edit on the white paper for the FCC thing, I'll, I'll do that whenever you say it's ready. I'll hand it off to you for for a final pass, just to make sure it's still coherent and and has the right right flow. Didn't duplicate anything or leave anything out, and I'll I'll try to get that finished as quickly as I can. Okay, all right. So um, I think I've given you everything I owe. I think you have, uh, and more. And <laughs> yeah, thank you. And, and so let me know. Okay. Yeah, I will. Thank you so much. I owe you uh, drinks and dinner and all sorts of wonderful things when we can meet back in person. Whatever, if and when we can ever get together. I have. Faith. I hope this dreaded disease gets over soon and everybody gets vaccinated. All right. Yeah, we'll uh, right. we'll meet again soon. Okay. Be good, guys. All right. You bet. can't be good. Be careful. You got it. <laughs> Bye.